Hello friends, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. Brother Zen, are you there? I am, brother. How are you doing this evening? <laughs> oh man, I'll tell you what. I, did you get a chance to listen to these guys before we did the show, or are you going to come in raw? No, I, I did listen to it um, a couple times, actually. Oh, wow. So you're all greased up and ready to your, – your rails are all greased up and you're ready to jump in. Folks, i got to tell you, before we uh, start playing these, what we're going to do is we're going to do kind of like a roundtable uh, discussion of uh, what these guys are talking about. Uh, and uh, real quick, um, you know, uh, to, for those who don't know about this, uh, there is uh, a black uh, – there's a uh, – the United States military – for a long, long time, and this goes all the way back. It tracks back to the whole MK Ultra stuff. It goes back to the uh, to a lot of black ops, super t- deep undercover, top secret type stuff that most of us had no idea has been, you know, ever ever happened. All right, now, uh, and part of that black ops stuff that the military has been doing for years. It includes what's called remote viewing, and um, and you know uh, you've got this guy uh, Major Ed Dames out there who used to be one of the head guys for the uh, United States military black ops. Now they supposedly came out and dissolved that just like they wink wink dissolved uh, Project Montauk. But then you then you have a whistleblower that that bubbles up and says, hey, hey, Montauk just took on another name, and now it's called Project Pegasus. So what happens is, even though they publicly announce, like under the Clinton administration, well, we're, we're, we, we, we officially apologize for MK Ultra. Well, all that, that's just superficial poppycock. And then, and then they, they, they pretend, they sweep it under the rug, and then they give it another name, and they do even more stuff. Okay, and that's the kind of stuff that, that this black ops operation has been doing with the remote viewing concept. Uh, they actually have, I think, it, I, if, if I'm correct, they use um, very similar technologies and methodologies uh, to what has been uh, discovered during the Project Montauk and Pegasus stuff. It has to do with tapping into the electromagnetic interdimensional uh, fields and stuff, and it, it's a little bit of a, t- a combination of time travel and, and uh, I don't know, maybe some kind of freaky astro projections. I don't know. All I can say is that uh, looking at um, the, the Ed Dames information, particularly his DVD called Kill Shot, It's fascinating because he sees a huge – I'm totally paraphrasing – but he sees a huge wind, a wind event, a powerful apocalyptic wind coming down upon the earth that is just – words can't describe how bad this wind is. And then it's followed by this huge fire storm that occurs, and he calls it the kill shot. Isn't it fascinating? That the first trumpet, which is the beginning of God's wrath upon the earth, is a third of the grass and the trees burn. Isn't it fascinating that the end of the movie Knowing with Nicolas Cage shows a solar flare event so massive that it causes a similar burning of the surface of the earth in that film? Very prophetic. So we cannot discount accuracy of what these people are seeing using these technologies or whatever it is that they're doing. All right. I don't claim to understand it. I don't claim to understand Edgar Casey. I don't know why he was able to see things that we can map right back to the God's judgments and wrath in the Bible. Uh, so it's amazing. But anyway, these guys, some of them have branched off and created an institution, an actual uh, for-profit company of kind called the Far Sight Institute. And they take it very seriously. They consider it to be some kind of a, I don't know, science or something. And, um, and what we're going to do, it, they have a, uh, what they did was they remote viewed, for lack of a better term, they call it RV. And these guys used to work with the United States military. Okay. And they, they decided to uh, uh, remote view uh, the um, pyramids. I just, you know, Made, they call it a target. 
And what's so astonishing about what they uncovered, and I don't want to give away the, 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 the moral of the story, as it were, but what's so amazing is that for years and years now, and Kenneth, keep, keep me honest, but I, I've written articles. I know, Zen, we've talked about it on prior shows, but, um, you know, I've said publicly <clears throat> that I do not believe and never have accepted this notion that a bunch of Nephilim or 30-foot giants uh, moved 150-ton rocks at Pumapunku in Bolivia. It just doesn't make sense. I have maintained for years that it was some kind of ET, non-Earth-born. You can call it interdimensional if you want to. I don't care what you want to call it. It ain't from Earth. It's not from planet Earth. It's from somewhere else. Okay, so call it whatever you want. All right, but I've maintained for years now that they, those rocks were moved with some type of a technology. I, I quipped about it and I said it's probably some kind of tractor beam, you know, like like the Starship Enterprise would use to move the rocks. And and, and I maintain that it's the, the the star beings, the Mayan in the Mayan prophecies, they say this is a summary of one of the Mayan prophecies. It says that at the end of the ninth wave or whatever, uh that there will be a global earthquake, that's Revelation six, verse twelve, and then the new men of knowledge, as opposed to the old men of knowledge, the new men of knowledge will return to the earth, that's star people, call them Anunnaki, call them what you whatever, fallen angels, call them whatever you want. They're going to return to the earth and they're going to establish a global government. Can you believe that? From 1300 AD, you've got this civilization that predicted basically what's on the back of the $1 bill, Novus Ordo Seclorum, what's in Revelation chapter 13. Amazing stuff, praise God. All right, it all tracks back to the Bible. So anyway, let me go ahead and start off with this introduction, um, and then we'll go ahead and do a roundtable from there. Um, this is amazing stuff, praise God. Here we go. The Great Pyramid of Giza, sometimes called the Pyramid of Khufu or the Cheops Pyramid, is truly one of the greatest mysteries on earth. It is huge, and it is built with gigantic stone blocks that seem nearly impossible to cut, transport, and assemble even today on such a massive scale as must have occurred long ago when this pyramid was originally constructed. Legends as to the origin of this and similar pyramids have grown, and some of these legends are now called history. But until now, no one on earth really knew how these big structures were assembled at a time when tools were rudimentary, camels and reed boats were the primary forms of transportation, and manual labor was the only means available to construct anything. In short, the legends, all of the legends, were built on total speculation. Authorities often connect all sorts of archaeological dots to weave a tale of who did what, where, and how, but quite honestly, they really do not know what happened back then. All the authorities have are ruins, and archaeological clues, however meticulously dug up, and from these they connect the dots that they select in a manner similar to how people see constellations by looking up at the sky and select stars that appear to outline all sorts of things, from the Big Dipper to Orion, the supernatural hunter. Depending on which dots or stars you select, you get different outlines, and thus different legends. But the only thing, the only thing that will resolve the mystery of the Great Pyramid of Giza is one or more eyewitnesses, something that, believe it or not, is entirely possible today. We can finally put the legends aside, at least for a moment, and take a look for ourselves. If you follow me through this presentation, I will show you data that will turn your world upside down. Data that were collected under impeccable scientific conditions and which, in theory, can be replicated, albeit with suitable training, care, and effort. This is cutting-edge science at its best. And what makes this even more fun 
is that many mainstream scientists are sitting this one out on the sidelines, caught in the trap of their own beliefs, just as many argued back in the old days that it was impossible to construct a machine that could fly, even long after the Wright brothers were flying their own inventions around quite regularly. This is as good as it gets. Let me briefly summarize just some of the key points of what I am about to show you. First, the Great Pyramid of Giza was constructed using a combination of manual labor and high technology. The largest stone blocks that were used in the construction were floated about 18 inches over the ground using advanced technology while manual workers guided them into place. Second, the mining of the largest stone blocks was done using advanced energy-based cutting technology that literally melted the sides of the stones from the quarry walls to make them perfectly smooth. Third, at least some of the workers mining the largest stone blocks were genetically engineered to be able to work under the harsh conditions required for the job. Fourth, there was apparently some extraterrestrial involvement in overseeing the project. These extraterrestrials may have worked in a manipulative manner, either separately or secretly, from the human elite who ostensibly were controlling the project. Fifth, the Great Pyramid of Giza was only one part of a larger project that had the purpose of manipulating energy on a planetary level that had a communication purpose. It was not just a place to put a burial chamber. And finally, a separate group of extraterrestrials apparently arrived after the completion of the Great Pyramid of Giza and they intervened with the society, essentially dispelling some destructive ideas and sharing some knowledge. This led to a collapse of the original society as a great exodus resulted when many of the masses left the area. Wow. Brother Zen, you want to open up with some comments on that? Well, what I think uh, that is interesting about the, the Farsight Institute is the way that they had um, brought these two viewers together and that they were able to be confirming witness for each other and that they didn't give them, they didn't see them with any kind of preconceived ideas or anything as far as what the target was, what the goal was, um, the way that they broke down each aspect of um, as far as the questions on how uh, the stones were cut how they were brought together, how they were organized and placed together, and then uh, also who who was responsible for the project and what you know the pyramids were utilized for, and then the strange and anomalous um, the answers that they got, which were mind blowing, especially to the, even to the whoever this guy is that put together the project, Courtney, whatever his name is. Um, mm -hmm. But the, he was shocked, and he was surprised that the answers that the remote viewers were able to bring back. Um, and when we get to that part, the listening audience will absolutely understand why. But it's um, it's confirmation as to the work that I put together as far as uh, Sons of God and the things that I spoke about as far as the the Dragon Lords and um, even with the inside of the MO tablets and having read some of these ancient accounts that speak about the prior times and that even with um, the the Temple of Solomon it, it if well there's some passages that when we get to the part where we're talking about um, how the, you know, the pyramids were brought together and everything, it, for people that don't know the listening audience, if you don't understand, um, Solomon was given authority over the fallen angels 
and that the um, fallen angels, the demons, they were put to work in building what was the first temple of, of um, the Most High in, in there in Jerusalem. And that, you know, like it talks about even when when Jacob um, saw the stairway to heaven and he built the altar, uh, even when Adam and Noah were instructed to to build an altar after, um, like after the, the global deluge, they were told to, to build these without the use of tools and that they were to use stones that were naturally hewn and that uh, they were not to shape them in any way. Well, it's interesting that even the Temple of Solomon, there's um, been recent evidence that the some of these stone structures were massive and that they were also like some of these megalithic um, megalithic structures that were put together that can't be explained how uh, some of these massive stones were placed and lifted and brought together really tightly and form-fitted. Um, if you don't understand that, you know, Solomon was given the authority and the power over the fallen angels and that he utilized them in the construction of even the Temple of Solomon, it, it, it would it, it's hard to explain it doesn't make any kind of a sense but this particular project that the Farsight Institute did on the building of the Great Pyramid will give people an idea for what we're talking about and how these things were done and then when we get to um, you know some of the answers and some of the clips that you're going to play I'll I'll share some some other passages which uh, speak about this also in scripture <clears throat> yeah amen um, and then you have the incredibly mysterious references in, for example in Genesis 11 where it's talking about the Tower of Babel which many advanced um, people uh, the, I don't want to call them theologians but uh, folks like you know Rob Skiba uh, a lot of other folks, uh, you know, we, we've we've come to the conclusion that there were exceedingly advanced technologies that were being used back then. Uh, and, uh, for example, you have the scripture that says, um, um, okay, so in uh, Genesis chapter 11, it says um, in verse 5, But the Lord came down to the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Okay, so uh, there's implications in that statement that uh, are far-reaching regarding the potential for some exceedingly advanced technologies uh, that existed, uh, you know, w never mind all of the, as you had pointed out, Zen, the ancient writings that indicate that Earth was in an intergalactic way station at one point, uh, that, that distant travelers stopped. There was, you know, you've got the Atlantis stories, the Lemur, the Lemur stories. It's unbelievable. Uh, Kenneth? It is. It is truly unbelievable. And you know what's so exciting? We were talking about this, John. It's coming from so many disparate sources. It's not just like it's you and me sitting here, you, me, and Zen sitting here talking about this. Like Zen said, these are two separate individuals. You know, they had that movie out, Watching Goats. So this is a program in the federal government. I'm, I'm not sure how it works, but it's doing something. And these people didn't have any suggestions and they come up with this information that correlates what we've been talking about. And, John, this is exciting. <laughs> I don't, I don't it, endorse what they do, but it's exciting. It, 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 it is in a sense that, you know, when you're researching all of the data, just like when, you, like when you read about the Edgar Cayce stuff and you see it, you know, you always have to take it with a grain of salt. But yet when you see it mapping back, perfectly to the bible it's like wow wow this is really amazing um praise god so let's go ahead and hit this next uh audio snip this is um 
this is a discussion uh, and now again uh, I'm going to I'm going to skip over a couple of audio bites that talk about the characteristics of the pyramids, the size of the rocks, things like that cuz most people get that. Okay? Uh but and I'll also mention what Zen was talking about, the remote these two, they, this they, the remote viewers. So these there's two guys, evidently these two particular individuals were very they were the best. They were the very best that they had on their team of, of this military black ops remote viewing team. The very best. And one of them lived in Hawaii, and one of them lived in another part of the world. And they gave them what's called targets to focus on, uh, the same targets. And what's fascinating is there was no collusion. They didn't share notes. They didn't make phone calls. And when they were done, the information they came up with matched. Okay, And uh, that makes it really fascinating. But anyway, here's a little quick snippet, a little discussion about the target data, what they were told to, to go after. All right, here we go. Now, the actual targets. There are six targets for this study. The first target tries to resolve how the biggest rocks used in the construction of the pyramid were mined. Did the ancient Egyptians use hammers and water-soaked wooden wedges, or did they use another more exotic process to cut those stone blocks from the sides of the quarries? Here's the exact wording of the target. The target is the mining of the largest rocks used in the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza, also known as the Pyramid of Khufu, or alternatively, the Cheops Pyramid. The viewer should perceive the location of the mining operation where the majority of the largest rocks were mined and the process of mining the rocks. The date and time of the target should be that which is optimal for perceiving the mining process employed with respect to the largest rocks used in the construction of the pyramid. A picture of the pyramid is also part of the target definition, so there can be no ambiguity as to exactly what rocks and what pyramid the target is referring to. The second target for this study focuses on how the pyramid was actually constructed. We want to know how the largest stone blocks were moved into place during the construction. Were they simply pushed around by legions of slaves, or was there some other way of moving those heavy blocks? The third target for this project is how the completed pyramid is being used for its originally intended purpose. That is, once they built it, what did they use it for? Was it just a burial chamber, or was something bigger going on? The fourth target again focuses on the mining of the largest rocks used in the construction of the pyramid. So this is, in essence, a repeat of the first target for the project. But for this target, a photograph of the pyramid was not included in the target description. We wanted to see if the absence of the photograph might help the viewers focus on the actual mining activity without being distracted by the mental images of the pyramid itself. Remember that these remote viewers are really good. And if they see a great pyramid during their sessions, they will likely recognize it as a pyramid and start to describe it. But in this case, we don't want them to focus on the pyramid, but on the mining activity. So this restatement of the first target that focuses on the mining activity, but this time without the picture of the pyramid, was an experiment to see if this new version of the target might get us closer to the mining information that we desired. The fifth target for this project addresses how the largest blocks used in the construction of the pyramid were transported from the original mining location to the construction site for the pyramid. Those blocks appear to have come from the Aswan area of Egypt and that was approximately 800 kilometers or 500 miles away. With only reed boats and camels, how could the people of that time have transported those large stone blocks such a long distance? The sixth and final target for the project is the subject or subjects who originally conceived of the idea of building the Great Pyramid of Giza in the first place. Thus, once we have figured out how they did it, we really want to know who organized it all, who was in charge, who was the mastermind or masterminds behind the entire project. 
Kenneth? The great who done it, Johnny. Who did it? Who done it? <laughs> Reed done boats it? and camels. Reed boats and camels. That's how they did it, right? <laughs> I, I think you know what I'm. You know what I'm picking, John. I think it's those those wooden wedges. You know, if you soak those, you put that wedge in dry. You know, and then you soak it with some water, and then you give it a little time. You soak it some more. I mean, what were there? A couple million blocks in there. That would only take <laughs> you a little bit of time, don't you? Know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, the wooden wedge. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put a vote on the wooden wedge theory. Yeah, they had some. Uh, they had, I'm sure they had some, like you know, ancient Egyptian, like Bruce Lee dude, who's like, oh, ah, yeah, and just like, you know, well, look, he cracked the 150 ton rock. <laughs> oh, I don't know. It's crazy. Praise God. So again, mining of the largest rocks. How were they moved? The intended purpose of the pyramids, uh, and who done it? Basically, are were the targets? Uh, Zen. Um, I'm going to read just a quick passage from the Emerald Tablets of Thoth because this also speaks about how, you know, these um, fallen ones were able to use vibration and had technologies that we don't understand. Um, it says this, Fast we fled toward the sun of the morning until beneath us lay the land of the children of Kim. Raging, they came with cudgels and spears, lifted in anger, seeking to slay and utterly destroy the sons of Atlantis. Then raised I my staff and directed a ray of vibration, striking them still in their tracks as fragments of stone of the mountain. And so here in this passage, he's talking about how he was able to use his staff, and this is, you know, uh, Thoth, who's one of the, um, he was an Atlantean priest king from Atlantis after the dispersion, after the destruction of Atlantis. He went to the land of Kim, which is Egypt, and he speaks about how uh, when they first arrived there, the, you know, the primitive people, the pre-Adamic peoples that were there went came after him, and so he used his staff and sent forth this ray of vibration and was able to hold them in their tracks. And so if he could do that with his staff in holding them, you know, with this ray of vibration, it could also probably be used to, uh, as they will talk about in probably the next segment, um, how they were able to lift the stones and guide them, um, and that it wasn't a matter of strength, but it was a matter of technology. Yeah, it's amazing. And on that note, we'll move into the next clip. Listen to this. Let's proceed in alphabetical order with the first collection of remote viewing data obtained by Dick Algeyer for the first target. Again, the target involves the mining of the largest stone blocks used in the construction of the Pyramid of Giza. How were they cut out of the quarry? Remember that the fourth target was essentially a restatement of the first target. So we can cut to the chase by combining the results for the first and fourth targets. In Dick Algeyer's original session for the first target, he records many images and verbal data involving rocks being crushed, cut, and pulverized with great force, apparently creating sheer cliffs. Great energy was apparently involved in this process, producing gaseous and shockwave byproducts. For the fourth target, addressing the same mining process, Dick produced two sessions. In the first, he perceives a great deal of construction activity. The workers appear to be slaves of some sort, where the elite, who act like high priests, just watch from a distance. He begins to perceive the shape of the pyramid and he unambiguously and clearly draws the nearby sphinx. Some kind of energy of dazzling beauty is being emitted from the pyramid, structure as subjects look on. Some subjects at the target site are confined in small and crowded cages and they are horribly treated. There is also some sense of human sacrifice and even cannibalism associated with the target activities. The viewer perceives some sort of high priest who conducts a sacrificial ceremony that reminds the viewer of a satanic ritual. 
The viewer also perceives and draws a subject who does not look human, a subject that he deems demonic and terrifying. <laughs> wow! That was the point in this, when I was doing the slicing and dicing of this audio, that was the point. Zen, you remember when I called you? Remember when I called right. you and you went, out in the, you went out in the driveway of your house and you were popping wheelies on your wheelchair and spinning all around <laughs> because you were, like, flipping out? Remember that? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That was when I stopped. I didn't even listen to the rest of it. As soon as I heard that, I hit speed dial to your number. I was like, yeah. I got to call Zen right away. Go ahead and comment on that. Oh, yeah. It's a, it's mind-blowing that, you know, these remote, remote viewers were able to see these things, and this is exactly what I talked about um, in my books, and also was what Credo... Mutwa had talked about in his testimony um, in in chapter 14 of Sons of God. I speak about the flying fiery serpents. I talk about the prior times and how you know they were the overseers. I call them the dragon lords, and how they were um, basically modifying, trying to create a slave race so that they could utilize these beings to do their manual labor and to uh, not only construct, you know, things such as the Great Pyramid and that those things were not done by humans, but that, you know, they were created by uh, the overseers with the use of these primitive workers who were the labor force, but that they were also involved in blood sacrifice, in a ritual um, victim sacrifice, the offering of their children, all those things which are spoken about in the Old Testament in association to these, uh, like Moloch, and to these olden gods and how they were worshipped, these idolatrous uh, cultures and civilizations that were involved in such abominable ritual. And that's, you know, that's why the, the Most High did not want us and Israel to be involved with these other peoples to intermarry with them or to take on um, the worship of the, the idol gods, these pagan gods, because these are the kind of atrocities they were involved in. And, you know, even with what we read in, um, was it Malachi chapter 3? Micah, yep. Micah chapter Micah. 3. Yeah, Micah. Yeah, where they it, it speaks about how they were flaying the skin off of... Uh, the people uh, of Israel and how they were even cracking their bones and they were eating the flesh and cooking them up in pots. I mean, those kind of things sound just too bizarre and too um, fantastical, but this is the kind of thing that was going on. Even the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 12, uh, it gives mention as to the the you know how these people were involved in in these kind of things yeah it's unbelievable i mean slaves slave race you've got high priests standing around uh then they talk about a beautiful energy shooting out of these things crowded cages with slaves slave race of beings uh, then cannibalism, uh, sacrifice, a satanic ritual, this guy says. I don't even think this guy knows Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And he's talking about satanic ritual. And then, then one of the remote viewers says he sees a demonic being of some kind. Kenneth? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to I cover that, but I want to wind the clock back to what um, Zen read on the last uh, go round about uh, from the Emerald Book of Toth, where he talked about the the sound waves. You know, there's a technology out there right now that that the researchers are, are at, in the University of Tokyo. It's called acoustic levitation, and they're actually using sound waves to lift things up. And then David Wilcox, you know, we talked about him in the past. He had that book, and I forget the name of it. But he was researching all the New Agers, and there's some people over in the Far East that have different ways that they can focus sound by resonance, and they actually levitate stones. 
Now, the reason I'm bringing this up to tie it into that, that observation of something demonic, you know, we know the story of Adam and Eve, and then we know them being cast out of the garden after she was beguiled by the Nakash, and then we know the story of Adam's uh, and Eve's two quote-unquote offspring, but we know the true stories and wrote a book on it. And in chapter 4 of Genesis, we see the descendants of Cain. And then we see a little bit later in there that all this technology was brought to mankind through the descendants of Cain. And then you start chapter 5 with, and this is the book of the generations of Adam. And then you go through all the good guys, so to speak. So, you know, this viewer saw something demonic associated with these technologies, and we see here in the latter part of Genesis chapter 4, in the lineage of Cain, the seed of the serpent and the kosh, that they bring in all these different technologies, music, and uh, the, the artificer of brass and iron and all these technologies. It's alluded to in the Bible, John. Oh, yeah. Amen. It sure is. Um, and then if you go back and look at the book of Enoch, I mean, it, granted, uh, uh, you know, this, this is talking about a time period that is post-Adamic, uh, and then arguably what we're looking at here is definitely, well, it's got to be pre-Adamic, no doubt about it. Uh, as a matter of fact, some of the greater, uh, the smarter, I think, the smarter scientists that are uh, have been investigating the pyramids, uh, some of their uh, data indicates a 12,000 years B.C. for the pyramids potentially being constructed. So that would be uh, uh, quite a bit pre-Adamic. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, all I can say is I am – it's amazing because Zen – I mean, you've got slave races. Well, let's just go ahead and move on, because because you know what we can we can. Oh, hey, talk to Tom. Go ahead. You do. Yes. I, I just want to make one real quick yes. comment about something that's written in the the midrash. Uh, the it's called the Pesikta Rabati. Um, it says this, and, and this is about again when we were talking about how Solomon utilized the. The demons had was given a ring that allowed him to control the demons, and that he put them to work in creating the temple of Solomon. Um, it says this: the stones moved of their own accord; they flew and rose up by themselves, setting themselves in the wall of the temple and erecting it, which is similar to the technology that we're seeing and talking about, and that they were able to see and perceive with this remote viewing and so um so you know there's a, there's a link to the megalithic stone structures that were also placed in the wall of the uh temple of solomon wow um and that's very tesla tech um very tesla tech as a matter of fact we'll just go ahead and play this clip um listen to this well for the second session for this fourth target the viewer clearly perceives mining activity. The mining activity involves the high-tech use of focused energy to fragment rock, leaving a crater. The viewer clearly describes this process in a time frame manner, as in snapshot after snapshot. Here is the original image that he draws. And he says this crater looks like one of the many sinkholes that were created in Nevada in years past during underground nuclear weapons tests. Then the viewer draws the time frames of the process of creating the crater. Now let's move through the frames one at a time. Here is the first time frame of the process. You have rocky land. In the second frame, focused energy is directed with pinpoint accuracy at a certain spot on the land. In the third frame, the land begins to give way, but not in a perfectly centered symmetrical manner in the fourth frame, a chain reaction is clearly in process. Finally, in the fifth frame, we have the resulting crater. The viewer then writes that the focused energy that creates the crater is like an electron beam that produces what he calls a sizzle spark thwack that causes a chain reaction in the rock. He notes that this would scare birds even 10 miles away. He writes, this is like watching a nuclear test at a Nevada test site when land shudders, domes, cracks, and collapses, but it is not the same. This is not a nuclear underground blast. I saw very focused, directed energy harmonics converge on one point from many directions and 
cause the earth, land, rock to fuse, vibrate, collapse in the sense of pummeled by Thor's bolt. The term Thor's bolt comes to my head like the way scientists or creators would name this. Wow. So focused energy, fractured rock, harmonic, um, you know, harmonic. It's a laser beam, and it's coming in from many directions and focusing some type of a harmonic plasma energy weapon of some type, a laser beam of some kind. I mean, that's pretty much what it sounds like he's talking about. Kenneth? It sure does, John. That's uh, light amplification through the admitted um, radiation. It's a technology that we've reestablished. Doesn't mean it was the first time. And like you said, yeah, those those um, those pyramids are pre-Adamic. But what we know is these critters, these demonic elements, they have uh, revisited us time and time again. You know, pre-Noahic flood, post-Noahic flood. You know. They just keep coming back, John. But, yeah, that sounds like a laser. It sounds like a laser, doesn't it? It, it does. It, it, and he said coming from many different directions, harmonic, uh, focused energy, extremely high burst of energy, t- birds flying in the air 10 miles away. That's a pretty big, I mean, that's huge. Zen? Yeah, uh, I think it has something to do with, you know, light, vibration, could be, acoustic sound um invisible rays i mean we don't we don't know but we know that you know the technology that we're creating today is just a reproduction of stuff that they uh the fallen angels had done even before the advent of modern humanity upon the planet and that um you know we're not at the height of civilization and culture but we're relearning and recreating those things that were already um, in existence and that were part of the history of of the planet and in prior Earth ages. You know, nothing new under the sun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, when we were, that was one of the things that Brother Peterson brought up on uh, on the Peterson Chronicles on how Ecclesiastes basically nails the fact that it's all cyclical on all of these advanced technologies that existed in the past, and and we're just kind of seeing that cycle repeat itself. Praise God. Uh, that's powerful. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, this is uh, this is amazing. Listen to this. Then the viewer note that large numbers of subjects were associated with this target and there is a sense of activity that is both scientific and shamanistic crystals are used in some manner there is a tremendous display of energy that is witnessed by these many subjects there is also the sense that the energy is connected to a grid or ley lines now let's look at a video that was recorded live while Dick Algeyer was doing one of his sessions for this target. Listen carefully to how he describes the mining activity that was used to obtain the largest rocks used to construct the Great Pyramid of Giza. Radiating lines of energy, okay, so like, all focused on a very precise point. So this is, and it's not, like focused beams but it's not in the visual you wouldn't see it physically but I can see it remote viewing it I can sense the energy coming in and it's I don't get a a sound to it it's a very high frequency harmonic um, energy converges uh, integers multiples of component frequency that rings like a bell, the um, Tesla, just intensely focused beams all converge and cause a reaction right here that radiates outward. I can't draw it right here. Radiates outward. It's a compression. It's a. It's a. It comes in, converges. It becomes almost like a black hole, and then radiates outward. 
And it's like when you watch a nuclear test from up above in the Nevada desert, and they, they show, you can see the land, and the land kind of, it kind of burps and erupts and, and bubbles up for a second, and then it, it, it collapses down into itself and then radiates out. So it's this energy comes, it, boom, it reacts, it comes up, then it collapses down, and then it initiates a reaction, and it, it keeps radiating out. So here's the initial reaction after the, these beams of energy that are not visible, but they're um, frequency waves, not sound waves. There's something very compact and compressed. It happens, and it affects the land. And then I just keep coming back to the Nevada test site where the land, you can just see that instant of a detonation underground something, and it's not a, I don't think it's a nuclear detonation, it's way cleaner than that and different. It just, the land reacts, comes up ever so slightly, buckles, caves in like a, like a fast acting sinkhole, so the land kind of all right, praise God. And basically what you heard there was the, the guy was actually drawing on a whiteboard uh, or, you know, and, and kind of mapping out what it was that he was seeing and how this, uh, this, 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 this focused harmonic energy, convergent energy, uh, caused this, you know, impact, this focused impact, breaking ultimately these huge rocks with, with laser-like precision, and, um, and he talks about the grids, the ley lines, the shamanistic element of it, the crystals. I mean, this is so unbelievable. I mean, it's very, I don't know, it's almost like a little weird. It's almost like kind of uh, ancient Hindu, Far East, New Age kind of stuff. Zen? Um, yeah, well, it, even... Edward Casey, um, when he wrote about Atlantis and Lemuria, he talked about how the um, how they utilized these crystals, and that crystals were utilized even in the Emerald Tablets of Thoth to open up stargates. And so, and we know that you know crystals uh, are used to amplify waves, like radio waves, even. You know, quartz crystals are used to transmit uh, and also to receive uh, television and radio signals and things of that nature. And so the technology is even in use today in that, um, you know, we found and located crystal skulls, um, you know, that they, there were all these different skulls that were found in different parts of, you know, these different old, ancient, like Chichen Itza and different places uh, of that nature, very old um, prior time megalithic sites that were also uh, hewn in massive, huge stones and that they were created and positioned and put together, you know, even weird shapes and weird stones and, and how they were you can't even, you know, fit a, a butter knife or even a piece of paper in between the the stones and that they've been put together and that they've held together through earthquakes and through uh, climactic changes and that these particular structures are are found even at the bottoms of lakes and oceans, like the site in Yonaguni and. Uh, different places uh, off the coast of Cuba, B Bimini Road, things of that nature. And so a lot of this technology is very ancient in that, you know, even with the uh, the Bermuda Triangle and also the, the Dragon's Triangle over there near um, Japan, which is also um, similar to the, the one here uh, in Bermuda, and that those are leftover residuals from the use of crystals and crystal technology, um, that they were opening stargates and inviting these interdimensional beings into, into this plane of existence, and that that was one of the reasons why the Most High, the, the Father and the Son, 
destroyed Atlantis and um, and also the other civilizations that were connected to and linked to this particular activity. And so, um, you know, if people that have looked into and uh, seen how these crystal skulls, they can't even be replicated today. And so, and there was a story of uh, an individual that was diving and that had located um, a, a what looked like a glass uh, pyramid type structure on the bottom of the ocean somewhere off the coast of Cuba. There was a story about this mm-hmm. um, in the Pakistani press, and he talked about how he, when he swam in, he found this one particular crystal, and he was able to dislodge it and bring it up and um, that it seemed to be part of a uh, almost like a some kind of technology that it there were beams or whatever it was was focused into this crystal and that those things whatever whether it was light or acoustics that it was amplified through this crystal and so um, there are technologies that are connected to crystals and their use as far as amplification that we don't understand that have not been replicated and that are probably um, there are probably things that are connected to them that are in use as far as black ops and um, you know technologies that the government has that uh, the public is not privy or um, pri- you know privileged to have and to use but Certainly, things like that are in existence um, because, you know, again, it's a recreation, a reproduction of those things that were in the past, you know, as in the days of Noah. Oh, yeah, amen. You have the uh, Judy Wood, um, uh, you know, directed energy, free energy technology, the directed energy uh, 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 hypothesis, if you will. She maintains that right. uh, th- that it was used to bring down the towers. I maintain that it's all of the above. I, I see the evidence associated with that free, you know, the directed energy technology. Uh, I see the evidence that she brings forward, and it's pretty indisputable. Uh, so it exists. Um, there's no doubt it exists. Um, it's just, and then of course that you you even have uh, uh, YouTube videos out there of Tesla tech. Uh, where they've they've levitated large objects off the you know floated them in the air and uh, it's just amazing the stuff that's out there and and that that's the tip of the iceberg of what the fallen angelic beings have brought into the earth in the past and pre Adamic earth in particular uh, we can only imagine what the black ops have their hands on today praise God Kenneth hey, yeah when you were talking about it sounded almost like Hindu or something it reminded me of what Oppenheimer everybody knows Robert Robert Oppenheimer was the father of our atomic energy program and the bomb, you know, like the Manhattan Project and all that. And here was a quote right after he was asked his thoughts after they detonated the first one out in Alamogordo. He, he said, and, and he's quoting right out of the Bhagavita, he says, I am become death the destroyer of worlds, and people may scratch their heads and say, well, why would he say that? Well, seven years after the test, he was being interviewed at Rochester University, so they was just being asked whether it was the first atomic bomb ever to be detonated. And here is his, his reply, and I'm going to quote it directly. This is after he was asked if that was the first, the one at Alamogordo, that he, he witnessed there when he quoted the Bhagavad Here's what he said. Ancient cities whose brick and stone walls have literally been vitrified, that is, fused together, can be found in India, Ireland, Scotland, France, Turkey, and other places. There's no logical explanation for the vitrification of stone forts and cities except from an atomic blast. So like Brother Zen just said, like you were saying, this is a reintroduction of technologies that were here before. And Oppenheimer knew this. He was well-read. He understood. John, this stuff is coming out now. Oh, yeah, Mohenjo Daro. Um, yeah, it's uh, absolutely beyond. It's mind shattering. It's awesome. Praise God. Uh, and it's great to be able to talk to this and talk to it, talk to this in the context of the Bible and how, how this all just maps across the world ages and, and the things that, that, you know, it's just amazing to get your arms around it and to realize things like, you know, the, the Sumerian texts, you know, weren't 
all completely, you know, like you say, Zen, uh, there's underpinnings of truth in virtually all these ancient uh, 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 writings, and, and it's all coming, it's all bubbling up now, and we're seeing it, uh, you know, even coming forth in, in these testimonies. Let's listen to this. This is amazing. Praise God. Well, so far this does not sound like a bunch of people chiseling rocks from a stone wall. Let's see what Daz Smith also witnessed for these two targets involving the mining process of those largest granite blocks. For the first target, Daz Smith produced two sessions. His first session is filled with perceptions of a great many subjects involved in working with what he calls large stone structures. The materials involved are multi-sided solid stone. The sloping sides of the structure being constructed are beginning to become apparent in his early sketches for this target. The viewer connects this target activity with the concept of a spiritual purpose and even explicitly mentions parallels with the burning bush and Ten Commandments biblical stories. There is also a great deal of physical energy involved in the processes involved with this target. At least a few of the subjects involved in this process have advanced telepathic abilities that seem to connect them with something larger in the sense of the universe. Well, Daz's second session for this target, in that session he clearly perceives the pyramid shape of the large structure being constructed. The viewer interestingly perceives and clearly describes and sketches one door at the base of the pyramid structure that leads down, not up, which is an accurate description of the passageway that leads to the lowest chamber that is cut into the bedrock underlying the pyramid. The viewer states that the structure is made of stone and that the construction process for this structure involves a great many humanoid subjects. The viewer does not sense resentment or oppression among the workforce, at least not at this point. Nonetheless, he notes that some of the workforce operates in deep pits in the presence of intense heat, fire, and burning. The viewer even explicitly connects the feeling of the target with the sense of the ancient Karnak temple complex. If you are surprised at how accurate these perceptions are, it is like I said earlier. These are among the best viewers on the planet currently. Wow. Telepathic connectivity to the universe. So right there, anybody who's done any kind of study on the fallen angelic beings, uh, the, the work of Mac, uh, 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 I, oh my goodness, uh, the, the, the one thing that is consistent, uh, it's a consistent report from every single UFOologist, anyone who has studied, studied the fallen angelic beings, and even the hybrids that the greys have been creating through their abduction and impregnation process, the Daniel 2.43, and they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, all that stuff. When you, when you collect all that data, the one thing that is consistent is that they communicate telepathically. So there you have the telepathic connection to the fallen angels. You've got, um, and then you've got these, once again, the resurfacing of this slave race, that, that the humanoid, they call them humanoid, so that implies that they were human looking, but not probably like us, uh, working in deep pits and intense heat. I mean, that's some pretty, that paints a pretty creepy, dark picture, Zen. Another thing that was mentioned is that they were sometimes kept in cages, um, that they all looked like each other and that they didn't speak to each other, but that they worked kind of like in a hive mind, um, that they were, uh, you know, just following orders, following directions. There was no talk amongst them and that uh, the overseers were beings that look like praying mantises or or like uh, reptilian type dragon type beings and that they didn't have concern for um, the longevity of their workers because they could artificially you know they could manufacture and create more that they were um, almost like they were cloned uh, is the the 
you know, the premise that was put forth. And so all these things are um, aligned with what I had learned in studying and reading about and and citing in Sons of God about the <clears throat> the primitive worker, which, you know, uh, I talked about the differences between these primitive workers and what became modern humanity and why it was um, that after, you know, the creation of modern humanity and the fall of Adam and Eve that they began their attempts and their interactions and interdictions were then focused on us and that they um, have since the advent of Adam and Eve on, and the beginning of the Second World Age, they have been attempting to um, modify and to create fit extensions for them to be able to to work through, and that they were able to um, to work through the global elites that give themselves up in blood rituals and blood sacrifice for possession and that they were able to control in the the will as far as the collective will and the um in the goodwill of all humanity by controlling things from the top down because these elites are you know they worship the fallen angels they worship Lucifer and Satan as their god they give themselves up for uh, possession and interaction with these particular beings they um, honor and they celebrate that connecting link um, and they hide it from the rest of the masses the rest of humanity but it's absolutely something that they consider themselves to be special that whole divine right of kings and the their you know being the chosen or the elect and that they have the authority is the power and the prestige to rule over the masses and that they you know have um the authority to control and to manipulate and to do as they wish to rule in impunity all those things are associated and tied to their being of the seed of the serpent the um the sons of belial right amen praise god Speaking of which, listen to this clip. Let's now shift our attention to the next big question, which is, how was the Great Pyramid of Giza actually constructed? This moves us to the second target in the series. Beginning alphabetically, again with Dick Algar's work, he did two sessions for this target. The first half of the first session is filled with many perceptions of repetitive mechanical processes working with rock. Great energy is involved in melting rock, as in artificial volcanism. There is mining on a large scale. Energy is used to cut rock, much in the manner that welding is done with metal, producing liquefied rock. The viewer explicitly describes what looks like high-tech alien mining. This description is accompanied by clear drawings of energy tools being used that focus energy on rock. The rock is both liquefied and vaporized, involving great heat and pressure, thereby separating the rock. There are also many life forms working on all of this. They have a hive mentality, working in large numbers underground. They feel like drones, and he describes them as not too smart. In Dick's second session for this target, he perceives drone-like humanoids who are genetically engineered to work under extremely harsh and polluting environments involving high-tech processes used for constructing large rock structures. The environment is like a foundry with toxic air quality. Everything is high-tech. Energy is used to melt rather than blast rock. Construction is on a massive scale and large underground tunnel complexes are involved. The workers seem to be grown from fetuses in artificial environments by beings whom the viewer perceives as praying mantis in nature. Watch and listen to Dick Elgire describe all of this with this session recorded live on video. Okay. Wow. 
Okay, high-tech alien mining, many different types of life forms operating in a hive mind mentality. Remember, Revelation 17, and these are of one mind. See, when the, when the Bible is referring metaphorically to these beasts and these, these, these things, these entities, uh, these are of one mind. Get it? Wow. And then drone-like genetically engineered humanoids grown from fetuses by mantis-like beings? This is very reminiscent of the clay tablets of the Sumerians where they're holding up the test tube. Uh, Zen, what do you think? Um, yeah, and it also reminds me of what Thomas Costello broke as far as what's going on in these deep underground bases uh, with these different experimentations that are, um, you know, with the the coexisting technology as far as the cloning that uh, both the government uh, and with these um, these hybrid races that they are like nightmare hall. Um, and all the different um, different hybrid beings that are created, and that there are even Thomas Costello was able to sneak out uh, even pictures and images of some of these um, hybrid monstrosities that are being created down there, and um, and you know, and this was decades ago. Uh, who knows what kind of Doctor Moreauish type things are going on now? Um, and what kind of, you know, as far as the alien abduction, where they're um, stealing uh, fetuses uh, in, and having uh, women carry them for a certain amount of time, and then they're stealing, you know, their pregnancies and taking their fetuses. And, and this is another aspect of that particular, um, what the experimentation that is ongoing and so Christ was absolutely clear when he talked about, as in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the second coming of the Son of Man. Um, and that the emphasis was on what the Nephilim, as the fallen angels, as well as what the giants um, were involved in. And Barosus gave us the accounting um, of the prior times and the different hybrid creatures that were being created back then. Uh, he talked about how uh, there was every sort of manner of half man and half creature type being. You know, we have the lion men of Moab mentioned in the Old Testament. Even in Maccabees 4, um, the, these lion men of Moab were working for the king and that they were the ones that were instigating the tortures against the, uh, the, the people of Israel. And so, um, there, you know, it's nothing new under the sun. We are back in those days. There's all kind of different creatures being found, uh, you know, on the shores of um, different oceans and different beaches worldwide. And that uh, even with that huge bat looking creature that's almost like the mouth, the mothman that was shot by the Peruvian army which had a you know it was 6 7 foot tall as bigger than a man had a wingspan of 15 foot um you know things like that that are coming to light and who knows what other kind of uh, creatures are still lurking in the interior of the earth and places that um that mainstream media doesn't reach and the internet doesn't reach. I mean, because there's still major parts of the planet, of the earth, that are, um, you know, primitive peoples or what people consider indigenous uh, peoples that don't have technology, that don't have uh, access to, to mainstream news sources or, or even any kind of media uh, most of the world is still it living in that kind of uh, circumstance and situation. And so 
a lot of you know there there could be still dragons on the earth and and weird creatures anomalous beings like I don't know if you heard I I just reported about there was a half man half a uh, half goat half man creature um a story about this particular being right here in the United States and that you know it's basically um uh, representative of what we called the satyr um back in Roman times in ancient times um, and that even Barossus gave an accounting of these particular beings, but that, um, you know, the like Pan, he was one of these satyrs, and he had um, goat's feet, and that he was uh, human halfway up, even though he had horns. And um, and you can look that story up if you, you can just Google it, or you can go to my website at fallenangels.tv, and there's... Um, there's a news story um, from one of these different local stations that talks about this creature and about how uh, he's been associated to uh, having come about from satanic rituals and um, things of, of that nature and that um, there's links uh, in, that, in that manner. And so, um, you know, and there's people, kids, still playing with Ouija boards now. They are doing these kind of things just to have fun. And now with all these ghost stories and uh, things, they're going into graveyards with their friends and trying to collect EVPs. And they're, they're doing all this just to have kicks, but they have no idea what they're opening themselves up to and that these different kind of demonic forces just can't be just, you know, shook off. And it's not about fun and games. And and so when they are influenced and they have these demonic attachments associated to them and they're not able to just shake them off, um, then, you know, in times of weakness, they become possessed and they end up doing things that they later regret and sometimes don't even have memory of. And so, and then, you know, with the way that America and the world is and how, so many people are on these pharmaceuticals, which, you know, opens them to uh, similar demonic possession and uh, satanic possession. It, there's all kind of strange, weird stuff going on in the world. People are losing it left and right. Well, and then, to say the least, and then you have... Uh, right now, you have a new series that's gaining in tremendous popularity on uh, H2 uh, called Hangar 1. And they're bringing forward information that five years ago was exceedingly taboo. And now it's on mainstream television. Uh, they just, they have, uh, I think it was the second or third episode of this season in Hangar 1, they they covered the Phil Schneider event. And um, and in that situation, it's all, there's also a book written called The Dulce Wars about that event where uh, Mr. Schneider, who was a Black Ops Rile 38 uh, uh, cleared, uh, G, 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 you know, black ops geologist. Uh, I, I believe I have that right. Um, was working on uh, the deep underground military base construction and uh, ran into large or what they refer to as tall grays. And the reason that's fascinating in conjunction with this particular uh, 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 testimony of them seeing these these tall mantis-like creatures uh, growing these fetuses, uh, you might, you know, anyone who would see typically a tall gray might perceive it as a type of mantis-like being. So, I mean, it's hard to say. It could have been some other, you know, type of being we don't know but um, um, now you've got you know, pretty much H2 you know mainstream television bringing out testimonies of uh, you know I consider to be highly credible the guy was executed uh, so that pretty much you know puts a stamp of uh, credibility on him just like with um, uh, with Bill Cooper and behold a pale horse I mean every time in Branton being thrown into the Bruce Allen Walton being thrown into the Utah State Penitentiary it seems like any of these guys from the deep underground bases that, that 
to start blowing the whistle uh, go on you know they have to go underground or else they get killed and um, and so it's just fascinating to see all these dots connecting and now even uh, this information coming up to mainstream television Wow and uh, we have a question from a, a, a late a lady by the name of Nancy she says as for you Zen she says could the pyramids the tops could the pyramids actually be the top of really large obelisks that are going down through and into inner earth into the lake of fire that's what you, that's for you Zen oh yeah absolutely even um, in the emerald tablets of Thoth when um, Thoth is speaking about the constructions of these pyramid structures that they are leading to what he calls the halls of Amente with where the lords of the dead um, are are located and these are the beings that he went to to tap into and to learn his knowledge and his wisdom from and so absolutely um, in fact uh, I think it also the Emerald Tablets talk about how a lot of these ancient structures were created long ago, even before, you know, modern humanity, and that the Atlanteans were the ones that created some of these deep underground structures, and that Phil Schneider, he, in his testimony, he spoke about how when they were creating um, these deep underground bases, that they were building on top of already existing structures. And also, um, just so you know, the, those that have access to the, to the chat room, I posted a link to that half man, half goat, um, satanic scion that it's, uh, the story's from Kentucky. And so, um, if, if you have access to the chat room, check out that video. It's not very long at all. It's very interesting though. Wow. Praise God. That's awesome. Um, okay. And sur not so surprisingly, that segues rather, you know, well, anyway, segues nicely into this next snippet. Listen to this. Now let's move to the third target in the series and find out how the fully completed Great Pyramid of Giza was used for its originally intended purpose. That is, let's find out why the people who built this thing actually built this thing. <laughs> However they built it, and even if they used advanced technology to cut the stones and move them into place, it still was a major effort of construction for a structure that is essentially solid rock. I mean, there isn't a lot of room space in the pyramid, so the builders were obviously not using it for simple shelter from the elements. So why did they build it? That really is the million dollar question. Beginning with Dick Algeyer, he conducted two sessions for this target that focuses on how the Great Pyramid of Giza was used for its original purpose. In his first session, the viewer describes both verbally and with detailed sketches a collection of pyramid-shaped structures that are separated by long distances yet connected with energy. The connection between the various structures appears to follow some type of energy pathway or what is sometimes called ley lines. That is, the various pyramid structures themselves appear to be connected energetically. The energy connecting the structures seems to be, at least in part, electromagnetic in nature. There is the sense of earth frequencies. The energy moves through the earth and it is either not natural or it is being harnessed and controlled. The viewer clearly draws the pyramidal structure of the target, accurately noting that the structure extends underground as well. The energy that connects the various pyramidal structures appears to run in straight lines. The viewer then draws in detail a collection of pyramids that seem to be closely spaced and explicitly states that this large, complex, and beautiful symmetry reminds him of the pyramids when they were alive, here referring to the pyramids in Giza. Near the end of the session, the viewer describes both verbally and with sketches subjects participating in the flow of energy related to the target structure. The viewer writes bright light, energy, like a half-mile-high Tesla coil. This 
looked like a light show at a rock concert, but seemed like many people watching the northern lights. But the energy spectacle is closer, awe-inspiring. At the very end of the session, the viewer shifts his perception to the inside of a tunnel that is geometrically shaped on the inside. He had the sense of a particle super collider tunnel. Now, watch as Dick Elgar describes live on video his perceptions of the Great Pyramid of Giza as it is being used for its originally intended purpose. Wow, uh, that was gushing with information. So we have pyramids connected, geometric patterns, ley lines, electromagnetic energy beams moving between them, uh, when a, f a flow of energy that the beings would use to communicate um, uh, bright light like uh, like laser light, uh, kind of, I, I mean, I was envisioning kind of like the whole Pink Floyd concert type of a concept. You've got the, uh, then you've got the connection back to the uh, super collider, the CERN, uh, you know, uh, super collider thing I mean it really it, it looks like not only is it used for uh, um, some type of it looks like stargates and electromagnetic interdimensional communication stuff I mean this is very Montauk this is very Montauk project time travel uh, Jody Foster contact type stuff um, really amazing to hear that and um, can you imagine what it must have been like to see that light show as they were because uh, I've, uh, you know, then you've got the whole Cydonia connection over to Mars, and I've heard testimony from some whistleblowers that claim to be, you know, otherworldly, um, uh, suggest that these pyramid structures are actually, uh, uh, you know, intergalactic, and that there are pyramid structures on other planets and other galaxies, and, uh, and that these ley lines actually, uh, this energy field is, is uh, it, 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 I don't know, maybe some type of wormhole Stargate thing. I don't know, Zen? Well, if all of this has purpose, that they were doing these kind of things um, as above, so below. So they were trying to call down the energies and to open Stargate portals for them to allow the fallen angels and these different interdimensional um, beings, the evil, even... Uh, in the, the Emerald Tablet number 8, they talked about how they were trying to open and they had called up from the dark below these evil beings um, and that they called them into this plane of existence and that they would, you know, gain access to um, different information, the knowledge of different technologies and different things uh you know, like even what it speaks about in the book of Enoch, where uh, even the watchers during the time of uh, Yared and how these 200 angels, when, having left their place of habitation, having left their first estate, they brought down information um, to the the children of, of Cain. And that they, you know, even metallurgy, the creation of um, weapons of war, uh, even abortion and things of that nature were taught uh, to humanity. And so a lot of this information is, you know, things that were already being pulled down and that, were, that they were learning uh, and teaching to pre-Adamic humanity so long ago. And that the, uh, the hybrid priesthood, those people that were ruling over uh, these pre-Adamic civilizations, they were tapping into higher authorities as far as evil and into their parents, their gods, and that they were trying to get information and, um, you know, to, to recreate uh, the technology that was lost uh, in olden times and different uh, eras of, of pre-history, uh, pre pre-Earth history. And so... All this stuff, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. Again, it's it's all stuff that is being recreated. 
Yeah, amen. And um, this next audio clip uh, is very, uh, it, it hints around at uh, the concepts that we've discussed on prior shows regarding Atlantis, uh, the Earth being referred to as an intergalactic way station, uh, uh, the, um, the, the whole Lemuria thing, all this stuff. It, it, it's all connected to these ancient writings and, um, and in here, in this little audio clip, uh, they, they refer to explorers and spaceships and new travelers showing up. So let's listen to this real quick. This brings us to our fifth target for this series. Specifically, the target is the transportation of the largest rocks used in the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Beginning with Dick Algeyer, he conducted two sessions for this target. In his first session, he describes a great many people collectively working with stone. The people are densely packed in their work environment. Dick clearly describes the solid stone blocks at the target site and the masses gathered together near those blocks in a scene that reminds the viewer of an old city central plaza. There is an elevated energy event that is witnessed by many subjects. Then, in his second session for this target, the viewer describes something that moves through the air and seems to impact the ground at some point. Now, Daz Smith also did two sessions for this target. In his first session, Daz describes an indigenous society from the ancient past that is based on slaves and masters. Yet there is great social change in progress, with some new subjects arriving from far away in vehicles or ships with new knowledge, new ideas, new medical knowledge, and new technology. An old system of beliefs falls away among the indigenous subjects, and subjects depart from the area with their families in large numbers. All this change happens over a decade or two. The newly arrived subjects are enlightened travelers and explorers, and they are the ones who start this new golden age in a short period of time. The primary location perceived by this viewer is an ancient city with temples. The viewer describes the basic physical layout of the pyramid's internal structure, as well as the arrangement with another pyramid situated in a wide landscape. Some of the structures have extensive construction underground. Let's closely watch Daz in a session recorded live as he explores his perceptions of this target. Wow, praise God. Um, <laughs> so again, uh, that seems to support uh, a lot of the testimonies of, the, of that whole intergalactic concept of Earth and the pre-Adamic period, the high tech, uh, the high tech. I mean, it all it just it just matches. It's it's absolutely astonishing how much of the ancient writings this all just kind of brings together not just the ancient writings but Zen as you were saying the, the Edgar Casey stuff and his uh, information about Atlantis etc right I, I just posted into the chat room this uh, passage from the Emerald Tablets it says far in the past before Atlantis existed men there were who delved into darkness using dark magic calling up beings from the great deep below us forth came they into this cycle formless were they of another vibration existing unseen by the children of earth men and you know this same thing talked about also how it was that they took over um, in the form of man they um, amongst us but only to sight were they as our men, serpent-headed when the glamour was lifted, but appearing to man as men among men? Crept they into the councils, taking forms that were like unto men, and slaying by their arts the chiefs of the kingdoms, and taking their form, they rule over man. And so, you know, that basically tells you how it is that they are the kings and the queens and the presidents and prime ministers, you know, seated on the thrones of the world uh, planet-wide, and that they are able to push for the New World Order, even though it's not beneficial to humanity in any way, but that even though it's 
totally harmful and it, you know is even harms their own children they're they're callous and they have no concern for humanity even those that are of their own bloodline and that they abuse and neglect and uh you know are involved in sexual abuse of their own children and so they they are callous in every way and uh this these ancient documents describe and and confirm exactly what these guys have brought forth as far as their remote viewing and it's things that I wrote about and and spoke about in, in just having read the ancient texts and the accountings of the ancient texts and these things are also in you know the gnostic texts that speak about the archons and the the things that they were involved in and how they had led humanity astray since even uh, before the advent of, of modern humanity upon this planet. Um, and, you know, unless you know that the the fallen angels were cast out um, from the upper heavens and that they were here before uh, the advent of Adam and Eve, uh, none of the geological, archaeological records and why it is that we see megalithic structures on both the moon and Mars and other places and how all these things tie in together, it, it just does not make sense. But when you have this discernment and have this understanding and you realize that the fallen angels were here before us and that they were the ones that uh, are were responsible for the creation of, of much of the megalithic structures that we find worldwide and even in other parts of the solar system, places like Cydonia, well, then it all begins to make sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. Praise God. Unbelievable. And uh, we'll go ahead and uh, skip up to the closing arguments that this guy makes, and then we'll bring the show to a close. This is just amazing, and we'll get your final comments at Buzz and praise Jesus. All right, here we go. So there you have it. The Great Pyramid of Giza was constructed using a complex mix of manual labor and advanced technology. The construction may have been manipulated or assisted by some extraterrestrials who seem to have worked behind the scenes. There was also plenty of human drama and intrigue involved, more so than is contained in any Hollywood movie about that time. And it is not clear how much the humans were aware of the extent of extraterrestrial involvement in their plans and activities. Some of it would have been hard to miss, of course, such as technology that levitated stone blocks. But there is no evidence in these data that suggests that the humans themselves of that day had developed the level of technology to do this, nor the technology to clone workers who could survive the harsh mining environments. It also looks like the drama was interrupted at some point, apparently after the Great Pyramid was fully constructed. What interrupted it was the arrival of highly advanced beings from far away traveling in ships. I can only assume that we are talking about other advanced extraterrestrial beings, ones that had an entirely different agenda than the extraterrestrials who had been involved with the pyramid construction project in the first place. Wow. Powerful closing comments. So anyway, uh, I was shocked when I when I heard this uh, when I just heard the first fifteen, not even the first fifteen minutes of this presentation. I and uh, the slave races, the the humanoid beings, cloned test tubes, the whole things tightly packed in cages, uh, demonic looking beings, cannibalism, sacrifice. Uh, I was like, oh my gosh, this is the Mayans, this is the Incans, these are the Aztecs, this is the land of Canaan this is all, and and it all evidently has existed so it it appears then i mean would you it, it's I, I would never have guessed this but it appears that these strange ritualistic satanic practices have been at the forefront of these beings existence arguably since the original rebellion millions of years ago. Doesn't it seem kind of like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. Every people, every culture, every civilization that they have assisted, that they have given technology and knowledge to, they have instituted 
ritual sacrifice, blood rituals, cannibalism, the drinking of blood. And so all that technology has had a price. And so for those um, that are espousing the ancient alien theory and that these particular beings are our creators and our benefactors and that uh, they have helped humanity every step of the way, well, they fail to mention that with the technological advancements and with the knowledge that they have provided, that they have instituted um, victim sacrifice where they, you know, cut out the hearts, the still beating hearts of thousands of people on any particular day and that they were using their knowledge of coming eclipses and coming, um, uh, you know, the as far as the changing of the sun, as far as, harvest and when to plant and um, you know when the summer solstice and when the winter solstice was all these different things to institute these abominable type rituals well then it becomes a, a totally different story and when you understand that the fullness of the story and you see that they have uh, led astray and deceived humanity and instituted evil just as the book of Enoch says with what the Watchers did, that the rebel angels also did similar things, uh, that it, it starts to make sense why it was that the Most High has warned us against taking other gods before him and to in, in, in building idols to these particular fallen angels or to worship a pantheon of gods, which are none other than, none other than the angels of the Most High parading as gods themselves and so once you understand all of these things you'll know why it is that the most high when he sent in um joshua into the land of canaan he told him to kill every man woman and child that was of this seed line because he did not want them to leaven his people and just like with solomon the way that he fell away by falling in love with these uh, pagan women and instituting worship of their gods. He didn't want all that to happen to the the people of Israel, and he doesn't want those things to happen to us now. That's why it is that they warn us about the strong delusion, and that they are that he has told us that even the very elect would be deceived it, if it were possible. Because look at how many people that are well researched. Uh, well studied that have you know studied most everything besides the hebraic text uh, the the bible as far as the old and new testament not to mention the extra biblical text but that believe the ancient aliens are our gods look at all you know i just did a show on the ancient alien series the satanic conspiracy and you have all these people talking about how satan was really the good guy um, and people can go to the blogtalkradio.com backslash Fallen Angels TV to find that show. I did it two weeks ago. But I, I'm playing clips directly from the Ancient Alien series and how they have turned it completely around, just like the Freemasons, just like the secret societies, all those different select elect groups that espouse that Lucifer actually freed us and that he didn't want, uh, you know, he didn't want us to not have access to free will and uh, to be able to enjoy the pleasures of this life. What they don't realize is that along with that free will came uh, the experience of evil and the knowledge of good and evil, that we are seeing the prevalence of evil all around us. And it's all as, uh, you know, because of the fall of humanity and because uh We've been led astray. Yeah. yeah. Amen. And um, and because of all this darkness, <clears throat> this cesspool that we're swimming in right now, praise Jesus. Thank you, Father God. The closing song tonight is has even a more apropos meaning 
praise you, Lord God. We just thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for Brother Zen, for, for edifying the, the listeners. Father God, we pray in the name of Jesus that this will help people to understand things and how, how significant and how great and how glorious your creation is, Father God, and, and how, how noteworthy and unbelievable our existence is on this earth, being raised up as a royal priesthood for the new age, return to our first estate, Father God. We just praise your holy name. We thank you for this opportunity to get together tonight. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you for this evening. And uh, folks, send out you know, uh, links. Let people know. Uh, be ye doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. Glory to Jesus, brothers. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. This was very, very edifying and fascinating. God bless you. Always a pleasure, brother. Any time. All right, take care. God bless Talk to you soon. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this video and this broadcast. We appreciate all of you and thank you for your patronage. Please do like and subscribe and share with your friends. God bless all of you and your seeking.